the taxpayers keep on paying and paying and we're getting poorer and poorer. Cash strapped and not ready to pay more. Tonight, new taxes and fees proposed for Toronto. To build a city we deserve after years of delay, we need to face facts. Leaders look for ways to dig out of a financial hole. Good evening. Are you ready to pay more for parking or see another sales tax? It could soon be more expensive to live and work in Toronto. We knew it was coming. A roadmap to deal with a major financial crunch at City Hall revealed today. CTV's Natalie Johnson joins us live with the details. Natalie. Well, Nathan, the message here today was clear. City Hall needs money and fast. There will be new taxes for Torontonians, some as soon as next year, so long as council signs off. Toronto is facing a financial crisis and services and capital projects will soon be cut. Unless, the city manager says, council approves new taxes and can convince Queen's Park and Ottawa to help pay the bills. The term I'd use is urgency, uh, but I think it is now very real. Toronto's top bureaucrat says there is no time to wait. New taxes now or the city suffers. Our financial situation after 20 years of kicking the can down the road with an inadequate funding formula post amalgamation, we can't play that game of chicken anymore. Recommended to Council, a commercial parking levy which could bring in nearly half a billion a year and higher on-street parking fees beyond the $5 an hour cap now. Other options include an additional land transfer tax on foreign buyers of residential property, increasing the land transfer tax on homes worth $3 million or more, raising the vacant home tax and a new monthly levy on phone users to cover 911 costs. Council is also being asked to request provincial approval for a municipal sales tax on goods and services bought in Toronto, which could bring in $800 million a year. City Council will step up and do our part. But guess what? Even if we do all of those things, and some of those are really hard to stomach, it's cover about 30% of what we need. As for the rest, the report reads, without a new fiscal framework for municipalities or sustained long-term funding support commensurate with city responsibilities, the city will have no choice but to further consider reduction of service levels and cancellation of capital projects. On the chopping block, nearly a thousand new previously announced long-term care beds and an end to talks on transit expansion in an ultimatum to the province. We need to stop digging until we've got ourselves on a, on a more solid footing. A footing that can no longer be financed by rainy day reserves. The city is broke, short nearly 50 billion in the next 10 years. So where does this go from here? Well, Mayor Olivia Chow's new Inner Circle Executive Committee will debate this plan next week with full council asked to vote on it in September. Reporting live at City Hall, I'm Natalie Johnson. Michelle, over to you. Thank you, Natalie. And as you can imagine, the idea of adding taxes and fees to help generate funds for the city is also generating plenty of conversation on the streets and no shortage of opinions. We already pay too much taxes and the taxpayers keep on paying and paying and we're getting poorer and poorer. It depends on the kind of tax. Our property taxes are way too low for to be a world-class city. We have to generate more revenue. We got a huge number of infrastructure projects that need to get paid for, and that money's got to come from somewhere. No, I'm not willing to pay more. My husband just retired, and he took some money from his bank account from his retirement, and he had to pay $3,000 on taxes. Toronto should be a province of its own, and all the money stays here and doesn't go to Ottawa. Then we won't have this problem. And our coverage of this story continues online. You can read about the opinions being, ex the options rather, being explored to fix the financial mess at City Hall. More details on our website, ctvnewstoronto.ca. Still to come tonight, the mass exodus underway in Yellowknife. As wildfire flames approach the capital of the Northwest Territories, the entire city has been ordered to leave by tomorrow. The latest on evacuation efforts by road and air. But first, outside we go here at home as we anticipate showers, possibly a thunderstorm this evening. It's been a steamy summer day. The cloud getting in the way of the sunshine at times and looking like it's doing that right now as we speak. Lindsay Morrison is here with a look at the current conditions. What are you seeing, Lindsay? Well, it's still dry for now, Michelle, but you're absolutely right. We're seeing an increase in cloud cover and a few sprinkles of rain not too far off at this point. I'm going to widen things out a little bit so you can see what we're dealing with. This is a cold front. It's sparking 
thunderstorm activity along the shoreline of Lake Huron right now across southwestern Ontario. Still non-severe in nature. We don't have any severe thunderstorm watches or warnings in place, but be mindful of the fact that as we progress through this evening, we are expecting some rain, maybe some gusty winds. We're already experiencing those, in fact. Winds coming out of the southwest, gusting in some cases upwards of 30 kilometers per hour to around 50k. Temperature-wise right now, we're at 26 degrees. It feels like 30. Time to bring those patio cushions in, though, once you finish your dinner, for example, because it looks like it's going to be an unsettled evening ahead. We're going to talk about your Friday forecast. It's going to feel a little more like fall. Those details are just ahead. For now, Nathan, over to you. All right. Thank you, Lindsay. A worker is dead after falling several stories at a city water treatment plant in Leslieville. It happened at around 1130 this morning at the Ashbridges Bay Wastewater Treatment Plant. Toronto police say the man died after falling approximately 100 feet. They ruled the situation was an industrial accident and called in the Ministry of Labour. Investigators were at the plant as the search for answers got underway. We're learning new details about a deadly hit and run in downtown Toronto. Investigators releasing information about the victim and a suspect in the city's latest murder. CTV's Beth McDonnell is live near Moss Park with the latest. Beth. Nathan, when this investigation got underway, police said a pedestrian was hit by a vehicle that didn't remain at the scene. Today, we learned the victim was being physically attacked on the west sidewalk here on Sherburne before he was hit by the vehicle. The man killed on Tuesday night on this stretch of Sherbourne, north of Queen, is the city's 40th homicide of the year. Identified by Toronto Police as 54-year-old Douglas James McDonald. Uh, it was a violent attack. It, was, uh, it appeared to be very one-sided uh, with the uh, Mr. McDonald uh, appeared to simply be defending himself uh, throughout. It happened shortly before 11. Police say McDonald was in a fight with another man before being chased onto Sherborne, where he fell to the ground. They say McDonald continued to be attacked while on the street. Then, seconds later, he was struck by a passing northbound vehicle and died. Officers say that vehicle is a white four door sedan and believe its driver is a witness in the case. They are involved in this event, but ultimately, I don't believe uh, that there's criminal culpability. So we would look for them to uh, come forward. Um, they, they may in fact have not perceived that they had struck a person and that's a possibility. Police say the man initially in the altercation with McDonald took off on a bicycle north on Sherborne. Police say that man has black hair with dreadlocks or twists. They say he was wearing a green hoodie with a camouflage pattern on the hood part of that sweatshirt. Also, he was wearing black jeans with small tears in the front of both legs. Reporting live on Sherburne, I'm Beth McDonnell. Michelle, back to you. Thank you, Beth. Meantime, the murder of a Leslieville mother has sparked a provincial review. Caroline Hubner Macarat was shot and killed just steps from a safe consumption site. Now that facility and others like it are part of a government investigation. CTV Siobhan Morris joins us live from Queen and Carlisle with the story. Siobhan. Uh, Michelle, the government's been clear that it was that fatal shooting that prompted this review, but it won't just happen here. As you mentioned, it's at sites right across the province and some advocates worry about where that could lead. The safe consumption site inside the South Riverdale Community Health Centre has been the focus of community concern for months. That conversation exploded onto a bigger stage when Caroline hubler Macarat was hit by a stray bullet and killed, steps away from the centre. Now harm prevention sites like it are going under the microscope. A spokesperson for the Minister of Health writes in part, Following the tragic incident last month, the ministry launched a critical incident review of consumption sites, starting with South Riverdale Community Health Centre. We are extremely troubled by this latest development and are reviewing what options are available to the government. Toronto City Hall welcomes the review. The challenges that come with safe injection sites are real, and it is wrong for politicians to dismiss those concerns. We need to roll up our sleeves and actually make sure we're addressing those challenges. We need a place where it's safe inside, but safe outside. The residents deserve no less. People who live near the spot where Hubner Macarat was killed are conflicted. There's been arguments that it's too close to the school, it backs onto people's houses. 
But where do the people that need the support go? I think management definitely needs to step up and do a better job, but I think they're necessary for people's safety, including the community and the people that use them. The tragedy that happened here, that shouldn't be the reason that we're doing a review. The review should happen because that's part of the process, not because something went on. This community outreach worker understands the review, but I am frankly quite worried about where exactly this is going to go when we talk about a review. What exactly are we going to review? The Minister of Health's office hasn't said exactly what the review will entail, but Chan McNally fears sites could close as a result. We do need these kinds of sites for a variety of different reasons and understanding again that they work. They save lives and the solution to somebody's life tragically being ended is not to put other people's lives at risk. She's calling for more funding to address security concerns and to build bridges between centers and their communities. Now, the management at this center has been meeting with community leaders for a number of months trying to address their concerns and those discussions they say will continue. Separate from all this, the government is taking a look at the work of public health agencies to see if some responsibilities might be moved off to the provincial or municipal government. They're also adjusting the funding. This is something that public health agencies and local governments have been pleading for for years. So starting next year, we will see the provincial government take on 75 percent of the costs of local public health agencies up from 70 percent. That was the change made back in 2019. They're also increasing base funding by 1 percent a year over the next three years. Again, those changes will take effect January 2024. We don't know yet the timeline for reviewing the work that public health agencies do. Reporting live near Queen and Carla, I'm Siobhan Morris. Nathan and Michelle, back to you. Thank you, Siobhan. He served with distinction as Ontario's first Indigenous Lieutenant Governor. James Bartleman has died at the age of 83. Bartleman held the vice regal position from 2002 to 2007. Born in Port Carling, he was a member of the Chippewas of Rama First Nation and was a staunch advocate for Indigenous people. Bartleman also sought to eliminate the stigma of mental illness and fight racism and discrimination. He launched the first Lieutenant Governor's Book Drive. It collected more than one million books for First Nations schools and native friendship centers. As environmental advocates sound the alarm, Toronto Water says crews are making progress in containing a hazardous spill. This follows Friday's massive industrial fire in North Etobicoke. It happened at chemical distribution company Brentag Canada. Toronto Fire says the blaze involved petroleum-based products and a thick sludge has since appeared in the water in both Mimico Creek and Humber Creek. The Toronto Wildlife Centre says it's rescued dozens of birds covered in harmful chemicals. Ontario's Environment Ministry says cleanup efforts have been ongoing. It also says there's no anticipated impact to drinking water. It's been more than three weeks since the TTC derailment in Scarborough. And tonight, Line 3's entire light rail fleet continues to sit idle. Commuters forced to take shuttle buses and wonder what the future holds for transit in the East End. CTV's Allison Hurst is live at Ellesmere Station, where Allison, we're hearing the possibility of getting things back on track has hit another delay. Yes, it appears the review into that derailment is not is going to take longer than that three weeks. Initially, the TTC thought it would be about three weeks, but we've passed that deadline now. And today, the spokesperson saying it's likely going to be a couple more. Shuttle buses line up at Scarborough Town Centre, filling the gap left by the Line 3 rapid transit train. I think they should bring it back because like, uh, the shuttle bus takes way too long. A train derailed last month with about 45 people on board, injuring five of them, just 500 metres south of Ellesmere Station. The TTC ordered an immediate review of the incident using outside help and expertise. We have three external consultants in who are helping us in three areas. Uh, track the infrastructure itself, uh, the power infrastructure and the vehicles. Uh, so they're working with our staff on that, uh, that investigation. Initially, the TTC expected the investigation would take about three weeks. But spokesperson Stuart Green says it'll likely last a couple more. Even if we bring the train service back, we're still going to be down a train, the train that was involved in the derailment. Um, so we're already planning now with the city uh, uh, for parallel shuttle service. Uh, so that's work that's underway now. The TTC says other plans are in place, such as running 70 buses an hour during rush hour to replace the RT when it's decommissioned in November. We need to see these solutions like bus lanes and more importantly, a busway, because of course you can't fit 70 buses an hour 
it, realistically on a Scarborough Street. It's, it's going to be very hard. The Transit Commission is working on a dedicated busway that would run on the existing line, but it wouldn't be done until 2025. The hope is that they can fast track that. The Scarborough RT has exceeded its lifespan by about a decade, and the derailment could be the end of the line. It clearly has problems, and if if it can be solved so easily with three buses all the time, why not just make it a regular bus route? It like fell up, broke apart, so I feel like they actually probably should shut it down. Despite problems, this rider and others say they'd like to see the train return. The shuttle bus is kind of out of the way and I feel like the RT is faster. This is pretty loud, not that great. The stops are a little bit, uh, how do you say, like too quick. Everything shifts in there and the seats aren't great, but overall it's still faster than taking a bus. It takes like 10 minutes maybe. On the bus, it takes longer than that. Green says if it can be brought back safely, it will be, even if it's just for a couple of months. And the TTC did do some tri uh, some training track runs today. They did have some trains on the track running through this afternoon um, because, of course, in this section of the track, just about 500 metres from here is where that derailment happened. Reporting live, I'm Alison Hurst. Michelle, back to you. Thank you, Alison. Now to a dramatic video shared by York Regional Police as they search for a serial arsonist in Richmond Hill. Back in June, we showed you this footage of a suspect pouring flammable liquid on a vehicle and igniting it near Berwick Crescent and 16th Avenue. Police say a similar incident happened later that month. Fast forward to 2.30 this morning. A security camera in the area spotted a man pouring liquid on a car. Investigators say he may have been injured by the flames this time around. If you have any information, police would like to hear from you. Police call it an accelerating problem. Auto theft and illegal car sales are soaring in Ontario. That's why officials are driving a new message aimed at curbing the crime and protecting consumers. CTV's Janice Goulding joins us live with the details. Janice. Hi, Michelle. Toronto Police, Crime Stoppers, and OMVIC, the Ontario Motor Vehicle Industry Council, are sounding the alarm about fraud involving stolen cars, saying consumers aren't aware of just how pervasive the problem is or how they can protect themselves. A new public awareness campaign today about a precipitous rise in car theft and a subsequent spike in the sale of stolen used cars. Let the offenders know the industry is taking notice. And lastly, provide the community with an anonymous crime reporting platform to identify individuals involved in this type of crime. The Ontario Motor Vehicle Industry Council says at least 30% of used vehicles listed online as for sale by owner are actually being sold by curbsiders, people who pretend to own a car but are actually just selling cars without a license or registration. In 2022, our investigation team laid a total of 2,115 charges, more than double the total of 2021, including more than 1,000 charges against alleged curbsiders. As a result, complaints are soaring about cars in poor condition with odometer rollback and non-disclosure issues. In fact, while police say about 50% of stolen vehicles are exported, the rest are usually revinned and sold fraudulently. It's essentially fraud, and the methods that they are employing are very, very sophisticated. So can they fool motor vehicle dealers as well? The answer is yes. If you buy privately and your car is reclaimed by police and insurers, you can be left without any compensation. But if the stolen car was purchased from an OMVIC registered dealer, there are some protections in place. For example, we have a compensation fund that can be there if consumers have a bad experience with with a motor vehicle purchase or lease. If you do plan on buying privately, there are two affordable measures you can take. First, you should order a used vehicle information package from Service Ontario. It will provide you with vehicle details, all previous owners, if it's been dismantled or crushed, and vehicle lien information. You can also order a vehicle history report from Carfax. It will provide you with accident and damage records, frame and structural damage, service records, odometer readings and rollback, and U.S.-Canada import records. OMVIC says a UVIC report will cost you about $20, while a vehicle history report will cost about $50. However, in the end, they could save you tens of thousands of dollars. Reporting live from Janice Golding, now back to Michelle and Nathan. Thank you, Janice. And as she mentioned, a large portion of car fraud is due to curbsiders rolling back odometers. Coming up on Consumer Alert, the story of a recent graduate who found out her used car had a lot more kilometers on it than she thought. You'll soon see new designs on some tractor trailers on the highway, raising awareness of a crime advocates say often hides in plain sight. 
Walmart will be the first fleet ambassador of the No Human Trafficking campaign. The initiative aims to educate the public about human trafficking and how to help those at risk. Four Walmart Canada trucks will be wrapped in messaging with useful information and links. Two will operate here in Ontario. The province says it's part of an effort to combat human trafficking along the transportation network. We've improved Ontario's rest area infrastructure with added lighting, security cameras, and added anti-human trafficking information, encouraging people to be on the lookout for the signs of human trafficking. The Fleet Ambassador Initiative was organized in conjunction with the Women's Trucking Federation of Canada and Crime Stoppers. A Toronto motorcyclist who walked away from a rear-end collision last month is sharing her story and is garnering a lot of attention online. The rider spoke with our online team about this video of the incident, which has racked up 28 million views on TikTok. Details on her health, her bike, and what happened with the driver involved are all on our website, ctvnewstoronto.ca. Thousands of residents of Yellowknife are on the move following an evacuation order for the entire capital of the Northwest Territories. A wildfire is threatening the city and officials wanted to get an early start to allow for an orderly exit. CTV's John Vinavalli Rao reports. This morning, wildfire smoke filling the air over Yellowknife as evacuating residents posted videos of their escape. So just hoping for the best kind of and uh, thinking of everyone that's having to stay behind and work really hard to kind of keep the city safe right now. Around 20,000 in the territory's capital and others in nearby communities ordered to leave by noon Friday with an approaching fire now around 16 kilometers from the city. The fire officials saying they did make some progress battling it overnight. That's in part due to the successful suppression work that our team was able to do uh, on the ground uh, and in the air. Residents being moved out in phases out of an abundance of caution, with officials worried the fire could reach the city by the weekend, despite some rain today. It's been the worst fire season that we know of. Uh, my heart goes out to the people that are being impacted. Um, this is now the eighth community we've had to evacuate. By giving the order now, it's hoped everyone will have enough time to leave safely, with fears the only highway out of town could eventually be overcome by flames. This morning, those without vehicles seen lined up to register for a flight to Calgary, where preparations were underway to receive them. We have committed to help up to 5,000 people find shelter and the additional supports as the firefight in the north continues. We have a reception centre. It is located at the Calgary International Airport. Many of the evacuees will be heading to Alberta, where evacuation centres have been set up. Some who've already driven towards them overnight encountering smoke and low visibility, with efforts being made to ensure gas is available en route. The Prime Minister holding a special meeting to talk about the wildfire crisis amid concerns the fires could eventually threaten both road and air access. And for fleeing residents, no clear sense as to when they'll be able to return home. John Benavalli Rao, CTV News, Toronto. In B.C., a local state of emergency has been declared for the city of West Kelowna and part of the West Bank First Nation. Today, officials warn the next few days will likely be the most challenging yet in the province's wildfire season. We are preparing for our own extreme fire behavior this week due to the convergence of dry lightning, strong winds and drought conditions. There is a strong likelihood of new fire starts that will grow quickly and unpredictably in the coming days. Brisk winds and dry lightning are forecast. Anyone who may be at risk is being urged to be ready to move quickly because the conditions are so dangerous. About 370 fires are burning right now with almost 150 of them out of control. The southern half of British Columbia has also been hit with a record-breaking heat wave which has worsened drought conditions. In Maui, the heartbreaking search for victims continues following last week's catastrophic wildfire. I have been at every major disaster in the United States for the past decade. This is unprecedented, Chief. 111 people are confirmed to have died. Officials say nearly 40 percent of the disaster area has been covered as of yesterday. The cause of the blaze is under investigation. A proposed class action lawsuit was filed this week claiming Hawaiian Electric was responsible after failing to shut off power lines. Emergency management officials defended the decision to not sound sirens. They say people are trained to seek higher ground when the sirens go off and might have gone toward the fire. 
A Canadian woman has been sentenced to nearly 22 years in prison for mailing a poison-laced letter to Donald Trump. Pascal Ferrier pleaded guilty to violating biological weapons prohibitions. The Quebec woman sent a letter containing ricin to the White House in 2020 when Trump was president, but it was intercepted at a mail sorting facility. Ferrier was later arrested trying to enter the U.S. at the Buffalo border crossing with a gun, knife and ammunition in her vehicle. They are an important weapon in the fight against Russia. Ukraine has released video of one of its domestically built drones. This is a so-called sea baby, an experimental drone. No information was disclosed about when or where the video of the waterborne weapon was taken. Ukraine says it started developing drones soon after the Russian invasion. Officials say they've been used in attacks against the Crimean Bridge, a Russian Navy landing ship, and a tanker. A $1.2 billion EV battery materials plant is going to be built in Canada. Putting Quebec at the center of the EV supply chain, I think is no small accomplishment. I think it's a big accomplishment. A consortium of the Ford Motor Company and two South Korean companies announced the project today. It will be constructed in Bécancourt, Quebec. Officials say the plant will eventually produce 45,000 tons of battery, battery materials per year for Ford electric vehicles. The Canadian government and Quebec will each provide loans of $322 million. Construction is expected to start in 2026. A Polish zoo celebrating the arrival of a very special set of twins. The male Persian leopards are getting used to their surroundings after being born last month. They belong to one of the rarest leopard subspecies in the world. The cubs were kept sheltered until recently. But now the zoos released video showing the youngsters in an enclosure with their mother. Members of the public are being asked to suggest names for the new residents. Still to come tonight, adding a fresh twist to that very familiar sound of success. Coming up, the new spin on the OLG win. And I'm Pat Foran coming up on Consumer Alert. As we heard earlier, curbsiders are selling used cars with rolled back odometers. A recent graduate thought she bought the perfect car, but the odometer had been rolled back more than 100,000 kilometers. I'll have my reports. That's just ahead. Well, because of all those wildfires burning across our country, we have widespread air quality advisories in place and drifting smoke is expected over the next couple of days. We've had elevated air pollution levels in the GTA, but I'm happy to report that tomorrow looks like a better day. We'll be at about a two on the air quality health index. It is going to be a cooler day with some variable clouds, gusty winds and maybe a few showers, but the weekend is looking great. Your full forecast is coming up and stay with us. We've got another full night of great shows for you right here on CTV. As we mentioned earlier, Ontario car dealers will now be working with the police and Crime Stoppers to try to reduce fraud. And one of the most common ways curbsiders try to make money selling used cars is rolling back their odometers. Here's Pat Foran and a consumer alert. Pat. Thanks, Michelle and Nathan. A woman who recently graduated from university needed a car and thought she found a great deal. But when she went to license the vehicle, she discovered the odometer had been rolled back by more than 100,000 kilometers. The way the market is right now, it's so difficult to find anything affordable. Samira is a recent graduate from medical school who asked we only use her first name. She needed to buy a car and thought she found the perfect vehicle on Facebook Marketplace. It was a 2013 Kia Optima Hybrid with 163,000 kilometers selling for $7,500. When she met the seller in a residential area, a woman's name was on the car's ownership. So I was thinking, you know, like this is... Uh, a family trying to get rid of their car. He told me his wife was getting rid of it because they got a new one and they don't have room in the driveway for it. The man said someone else was planning to buy the car so she would need to purchase it right away. He said he had the used vehicle information package but never provided it. They went to the bank, she paid for the car, but when she went to Service Ontario, she found out the mileage on the car was not 163,000 kilometers. The odometer had been rolled back from 265,000. The car had more than 100,000 kilometers more than she thought it had extremely devastated like I would not have even taken the time out of my day to go look at this car if I knew that this is the like um, the mileage that I had on there. 
Criminals are using tools that allow them to roll back odometers so thousands of kilometers can just disappear. CTV News has done many stories over the years involving vehicles with rolled back odometers. When you buy a car privately, you don't have the same protections as when buying through an OMVIC registered dealer, which is why you have to make sure the seller is legitimate and not a curbsider. Chances are if you're buying through a curbsider, there's something wrong with that vehicle. The odometer's been rolled back. Samir found out after buying the car, the seller had been previously charged by OMVIC for rolling back odometers multiple times. She's been advised to file a complaint. She wanted to share her story to warn other buyers to be careful. Maybe my story could be something that other people can learn from. And rolling back odometers is a crime punishable by fines or jail time. If you plan to buy a car privately, don't be rushed. Take it to your own mechanic for an inspection. If they won't let you do that, it's probably best to walk away. On your side, I'm Pat Foran. If you have a consumer story idea, email us at alert at ctv.ca. Right to the forecast as we look at tonight and tomorrow, there are some changes happening. Mm -hmm. Mother Nature is going to roll back the temperature, yeah. going to be feeling a bit fall-like, mm -hmm. and then there's some rain in the mix. And you know what? There's a bit of a feeling in the air right now that rain is coming. And while it's not a lot of rain tonight, we might get some gusty winds, maybe some thunder and lightning as this line rolls through. And then tomorrow, definitely an autumnal feel in the air. But the weekend is going to bring us a return to warmth and sunshine. Weather is brought to you by Train, the most reliable heating and cooling brand. It's hard to stop a train. So here's what we're dealing with on the satellite and radar imagery. Many people in beach communities along the Huron shorelines, uh, as far south, in fact, as Chatham, but over toward Bayfield, Godridge, into King Cardin and Port Elgin, dealing with thunderstorm activity right now. We'll zoom in a little bit closer. There's a line of showers just ahead of that impacting Brantford, over toward Acton, into the Tottenham area, and uh, perhaps in through Barrie, you might be seeing a few sprinkles of rain at this hour, too. It's on its way toward us here in the GTA. It's a big low pressure system, the center of this low over northern parts of Ontario. So yeah, as we make our way through the evening hours tonight, plan on there being some wet weather, maybe thunder and lightning. You'll have to move indoors if that happens. And as the low rotates, this is where we're going to see and feel a change for tomorrow. So there's about 10 o'clock tonight, but really the window of opportunity for active weather begins now and continues until about midnight. There's going to be clearing overnight, waking up, might be dealing with showers, might be dry, but as the day goes on and that low uh, rotates, we'll see the wraparound effect, some leftover showers, some variable clouds, and some pretty strong winds as well. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. By tomorrow, late afternoon or evening, I'm hopeful that we're going to see some clearing and hopefully sun in parts of the GTA. If we don't, though, there is plenty of it in store for Saturday with a bit of an increase in cloud cover happening into Saturday evening. Overnight tonight, this is where the cool down begins. 14 is our forecast low. Winds are going to be coming out of the west and the north, maybe gusting upwards of 60 kilometers per hour in some cases tomorrow. Couple that with the very variable clouds and that chance of showers. And we're only looking at a daytime high of around 20, 21 degrees here in Toronto. Might remain in the teens. Look at Waterloo, 17, the forecast high for tomorrow. So perhaps it's not a picture perfect start to the CNE, but I think many people are going to be heading to the X regardless. And then the weekend looks good. 26 degrees for Saturday with mainly sunny skies. Feeling like the mid 30s on Sunday afternoon. We're seasonal through the early part of next week with just a chance of showers Monday through Wednesday. That's your look at the weather for now. Nathan, over to you. All right, thank you, Lindsay. Creating a legacy for a police officer who gave his life in the line of duty. A new scholarship for the person who represents the best in athletics, academics, and helping others. That's coming up. It's been nearly eight months since OPP Constable Greg Prashala was killed in the line of duty. As family, community and colleagues mourn his loss, efforts to honor the fallen officer are taking a major step forward. The 28-year-old was shot and killed responding to a call west of Hagersville back in December. Back in May, roughly 1,000 runners and walkers laced up in Prashala's hometown of Barrie for a memorial run. OPP now say that event raised nearly $20,000. The constable's family says they're using the money raised in part to establish a scholarship in his name at his former high school. 
Greg was always just an individual that was always looking to help people. If it wasn't helping around the house, he'd always be looking to help in the community. So what better way to honor him than to do, do this by helping out an individual? The Prashala family set the conditions for the scholarship so it would go to someone they felt represented Greg's legacy. They emphasized factors like athletic and academic achievement and a desire to help others. After reports last night that Britney Spears and her husband are getting a divorce, we're learning a few more details. Sam Asghari and Britney Spears married 14 months ago. The pair met when the now 29-year-old model and actor appeared in one of the pop star's videos in 2016. Asghari's divorce filing cited irreconcilable differences as the reason for the split with the 41-year-old. Spears hasn't commented. Actor Jamie Foxx is sharing another update on his health after a major scare left him hospitalized back in the spring. Foxx still hasn't said what the medical issue was, but the 55-year-old shared a video in July thanking his medical team and family for helping him through. Last night, he took to Instagram, posting a few selfies and saying in part, You're looking at a man who is thankful, finally starting to feel like myself. It's been an unexpected dark journey, but I can see the light. A long-awaited reunion is set to take place at this year's Toronto International Film Festival. A new 4K restoration of the Talking Heads concert film, Stop Making Sense, will debut as part of the festival nearly 40 years after it first screened. All four original members of the Talking Heads will attend a post-screening talk moderated by Spike Lee, reuniting for the first time since 2002. Miley Cyrus confirmed she's got some new music on the way. The singer posted a video announcing a single called Used to Be Young will be released later this month. Cyrus said the track is dedicated to her loyal fans for loving every version of her. The single comes out August 25th, one day after Miley Cyrus takes part in a retrospective interview and TV special. And on the same day, August 25th, fellow former Disney Channel star Selena Gomez will be releasing her own new single. The singer said she's still not quite done with her next full album, but she wanted to put out a song she wrote a while back that she says is perfect for the end of summer. And Canadian rockers 5440 are coming out with some new music. Live at Elma Combo is being released tomorrow on vinyl. The performance was recorded September 18th, 2020 at the famous music venue. The release will be celebrated with a show tomorrow night at the El Macombo. Stars Tonight is brought to you by Last Man's Bad Boy. Who's better? Nobody. New research reveals deals still exist for home buyers. After the break, which Toronto neighborhoods offer the most affordable condos, much cheaper than the city average? The term I'd use is urgency, uh, but I think it is now very real. Updating our top stories, new taxes and fees are being eyed by Toronto City staff to cushion a financial crunch, meaning things like parking could get more expensive or residents could see the return of a sales tax. Uh, it was a violent attack. It, was, uh, it appeared to be very one-sided. Toronto police are revealing more information about a fatal hit and run in Moss Park earlier this week. Investigators say the 54-year-old man got into a fight with another man before falling to the ground. He was then fatally struck by a vehicle. Police are asking the driver to contact them as a witness. It's been the worst fire season that we know of. Uh, my heart goes out to the people that are being impacted. Thousands of residents of Yellowknife are on the move following an evacuation order for the entire capital of the Northwest Territories. Many evacuees are heading to Alberta with fears the only highway out of town could eventually be overcome by flames. Remember to keep up to date day and night through our website, ctvnewstoronto.ca, and by downloading the CTV News app. And if you have a news tip, photos, or video of breaking news, let us know. In business, Canada's electric vehicle battery industry is getting another boost. We mentioned it earlier in the newscast. BNN Bloomberg's Jacqueline Hansen has more on a new battery production plant announced today. 
A small town at the midway point between Quebec City and Montreal will soon be home to a $1.2 billion battery materials production plant. Ford is teaming up with two South Korean battery making firms to build the plant. The federal and Quebec governments will pitch in half of the funding to build it, each contributing $322 million. The plant is expected to create more than 345 jobs and produce 45,000 tons of materials annually. Those materials will supply Supply batteries for Ford's future electric vehicles. Let's take a look at some of the closing market numbers for today. The Canadian dollar is trading fairly flat at 73.84 cents U.S. West Texas Intermediate Oil gained a little less than a dollar to almost $80 U.S. a barrel. And Western Canadian Select declined just slightly to about $62 U.S. a barrel. As for stock markets, the TSX fell 86 points to end the day at 19,812.23. That is the latest in business. I'm Jacqueline Hansen of BNM Bloomberg. A new real estate report is highlighting Toronto's best neighborhoods for condo buyers if affordability is top of mind. Real estate brokerage Zoo Casa crunched the numbers from listings across the city. Compared to the average price of around $753,000, the eastern and western parts of the city were much more likely to see lower average sale prices. The lowest was around $462,000 in West Hill, Centennial, Scarborough. Central and downtown areas were usually above average in sales price. And with employees at many GTA Metro stores still on the picket lines, the grocery giant is asking the province to help them reach a contract deal with the union. The company says it hopes a third party conciliator will appointed by the Ministry of Labor can help break this impasse. Unifor Local 414 responded quickly saying it's not interested unless Metro comes back to the table with an improved wage offer. Around 3,700 Metro workers have been on strike since late July at 27 GTA locations. The Blue Jays were hoping for the sweep as they wrapped up a two-game series against the Phillies. And a base hit into right. With the game tied at two in the bottom of the third, Kevin Biggio brought in two runners, making it four to two. But the Phillies would come back and score seven more runs, winning the game nine to four. The Jays start a series with the Reds Friday in Cincinnati. And the Jays could get a major boost as they head out on the road. Shortstop Bo Bichette could rejoin the team on Friday. Bichette suffered a knee injury, rounding the bases back on July 31st. His 321 batting average ranked second in the American League. Meanwhile, it won't be long until the Toronto Raptors are back in action. Today, the team released its schedule for the season. The Raps' first game is October 25th when they host the Minnesota Timberwolves. Other notable dates include former head coach Nick Nurse returning to Scotiabank Arena with the Philadelphia 76ers on October 28th. The annual Giants of Africa game celebrating the life of Nelson Mandela is on December 1st. Toronto hosts former Raptor Fred Van Vliet and the Houston Rockets February 9th. And the final game of the regular season is April 14th against Kyle Lowry and the Heat in Miami. A remix to a jingle that for lottery players is music to your ears. The OLG releases a winning tune that's gone viral. The sound of a new generation coming up. Tonight, thousands on the move in Yellowknife, away from the looming threat of raging wildfires. I'm glad I was able to get out early. The unprecedented evacuation effort as crews tried to keep the fires at bay. Later on CTV National News. And a reminder, the CTV News at 6 podcast is available as a download every weeknight. And a special hello to all of you listening to the newscast live on News Talk 1010. Get Toronto's top stories, breaking news alerts, and watch live. Download the CTV News app. Ontario lottery players know the sound very well. We're talking about the OLG's iconic winner gagnant tune. Well, it's got a fresh new take. Award-winning artists London's Loud Luxury and Timmins' Preston Pablo crafted the remix of the famous winner tune. This is part of the OLG's 30th anniversary celebrations, and company officials say it's a way to connect with a new generation. He said, listen, just put a fresh spin on it. See what you can do, but we want to keep that iconic sound. They came up with that wonderful remix that, again, has that electronic music dance mix, uh, 
carries on with the winter Gagnon sound as well, too. And we've been introducing it across the province at music festivals, at various festivals that we sponsor, because we sponsor about 250 festivals across the province each year. So we just introduced it, but it is going uh, viral. For now, the classic wind tone will continue to play at OLG terminals, but you can listen to the remix at bringhomethewind.ca. And just in case you were wondering, the OLG says winning tune sounds off around 180 million times a year province-wide. It is catchy, I have to admit, I do yeah. like it. I really like it, it's very good. <laughs> now, if we had to write a tune, for tomorrow's weather forecast, what would it be? Rain, rain, <laughs> go away. Well, that's more so for this evening. Tomorrow, yeah, possibly a few showers as well. It's also going to be a little bit brisk and chilly tomorrow, dare I say, at least for mid-August. Here's one more look at the satellite and radar. This will give you an idea of where the wet weather is right now. Some thunder and lightning associated with that line also, so just be mindful as we make our way through this evening. It is headed our way. These are non-severe thunderstorms worth mentioning too. Uh, overnight tonight, we dropped to a low of 14 degrees. Degrees. Tomorrow's high might only be about 21. That's a little cool for this time of year. But the seven day forecast shows a return to some summertime heat, especially by Sunday. And then we're seasonal through the early part of next week. Overall, not a bad looking seven day forecast. Nathan and Misha. Not bad at all. Thank you, Lindsay. Be sure to join Omar Sachedina tonight at 11 for CTV National News, followed by Zoraida Allman with our next local newscast. At 11:30. In the meantime, our coverage continues anytime on CP24 and online at CTVNewsToronto.ca. For Lindsay Morrison and all of us at CTV News, thank you for watching and have a good night.